Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's uh, nice to be here. Um, yeah, I'm going to be telling you about this story that we have about a protein from E. coli. Uh, just to sort of start out to motivate things, uh, I want to make a, whoop, sorry, a somewhat obvious point, uh, but it's just that for single cell organisms, life is pretty hard. If you think about the cells inside of your body or other multicellular organisms, while maybe you are going to step outside and experience big changes in temperature or jump for a swim in the ocean or a pool filled with chlorine and get exposed to different chemicals um, or go for periods between meals for several hours where nutrients go up and down, inside of your body, everything is kept much more regular. And so the temperature is held at a constant level, salt is uh, uh, controlled, uh, chemicals, harmful chemicals are kept away from your cells and uh, you know you might not eat for a while, but your body will pull out nutrients in storage and, and make sure that the cells have what they need to get by. So they're very coddled. But when the environment changes for a single-celled organism, uh, things are much more much more harsh. They have to deal with all these problems directly, and so you know they have to experience all of these stresses and find a way to deal with them without dying, which is uh, can be very difficult. And in the case of uh, E. coli and many other bacteria, they have a secret weapon that helps them deal with these different stresses. And that's a protein called uh, DPS. So that's a, a DNA binding protein that was identified in starved cells uh, that was identified uh, just a little over 30 years ago now. And if you look at all the proteins that associate with the E. coli nucleoid, during periods of exponential growth. DPS is there, but not at a terribly high copy number, and it doesn't seem to be uh, doing a whole lot while it's there. If you starve the cells, especially if you starve the cells for a long time though, uh, DPS gets produced, uh, a ton of DPS just sort of floods the cell and gets produced. And so it becomes by copy number, at least the most abundant nucleoid associated protein that's attached to the DNA. Uh, and it also really transforms the cell. So what you see inside of uh, EM pictures where DPS is present and you starve the cells, or if you uh, overexpress DPS, especially you can see this, you get these large structures of DPS and DNA. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving around here, uh, but uh, this sort of light gray region uh, between the little dots, the, the black dots represent um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> ribosomes floating around in the cytoplasm. So this gray region shows the complex of DNA and DPS forming in there. And if you don't have DPS, then cells start for the same amount of time to show a much more uniform cytoplasm. They don't have these big structures. Uh, the, the structure of DPS itself is very elegant. It has 12 sub subunits that come together to form this dodecamer. The dodecamer is essentially a, a spherical shape. So it's nice and round. It's about nine nanometers in diameter and it has a hollow core in the middle that's about four and a half uh, nanometers wide. Uh, the crystal structures of DPS unfortunately don't ever capture the N-terminal regions. So there's about uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, residues that stick out at every N-terminus uh, of these different subunits and they are thought to be disordered regions of protein. They stick out into solution and they have residues on them that are important for binding DNA. So binding DNA happens around the periphery of this dodecamer. There's also an enzymatic site at the core. I mentioned that there's that hollow four and a half nanometer core at the center of this dodecamer and that has a peroxidase active site. Uh, the peroxidase active site sits actually at sort of the cleft between a pair of subunits. So there's six regions that have active sites inside of the core. <clears throat> and what that active site does is it's a peroxidase. It oxidizes iron. That might not seem obvious why that would be helpful to a cell to oxidize iron to protect itself. But iron is a, a very reactive species. It can cause lots of oxidative damage inside of the cell. And if you oxidize iron two into iron three, it will crystallize into uh, an iron oxide uh, particle inside of the DPS. So what you see over here is the iron oxide particles of uh, DPS sort of building up in averaged EM images and sort of reconstructed down there. 
Another bonus of that enzymatic activity is that it's also very good at removing hydrogen peroxide. So basically two species that can cause a lot of damage inside of cells are being removed. Uh, now you have something that binds DNA. It also has this enzymatic activity. Which of the two things is important for protecting the cell from stress? And the answer is both. Uh, so this was uh, a study done in Ann Meyer's lab, who we work with uh, on uh, studying DPS uh, from a few years back. And you can see in this case, we're looking at the number of colony forming units uh, in different uh, uh, growth conditions for E. coli bacteria. And we have lines, sort of strains of bacteria that either have modified DPS enzymes in them. So we can make mutations in sort of this N-terminal region and inhibit DNA binding. You can also make a mutation at the active site to get rid of the peroxidase activity. And for good measure, there's also a silent mutation uh, that's being made uh, that's sort of in, in between these two places. We also look at what happens when you knock out DPS entirely. So uh, when you have cells growing in exponential phase, or if they're, you know, they have very small amounts of stress, like you let them grow overnight, uh, DPS doesn't do a whole lot. We don't really see much change in how many cells survive under these conditions. However, it's a different story if we start exposing the cells to stress during these periods. And then we see that both knocking out the binding to DNA or knocking out the active site, all of these contribute to making it more difficult for the cells to survive uh, stresses, whether it's changing the temperature to temperatures too high for bacteria to really enjoy, whether it's exposing them to uh, hydrogen peroxide or extra iron ions or antibiotics or high conditions of salt or just longer periods of starvation. It's uh, both of these things working together, binding the DNA and also the peroxidase activity that seem to be important for protecting the DNA itself. Now, um, the question of how DPS binds to DNA is a very interesting and complicated one. And uh, I just wanna show you these EM images that uh, are meant to give you an idea of the range of structures that are sometimes observed inside of cells. Uh, DPS can form crystalline arrays with the DNA, uh, so a very regular uh, uh, pattern. Um, other studies have shown that you can actually you know, see, you can, you can look at these arrays and you can you know, measure the crystal spacing between the DPS and the DNA. Um, it can also form what the authors termed uh, in this paper, a liquid crystalline phase. So you see something that looks much more folded, uh, folded structure of density. Um, you also see sometimes uh, these, uh, this, this was sort of new to the paper when it was published, uh, but it can form these sort of balls of DNA and DPS inside of the cell. Um, other studies have seen toroidal structures uh, arising from DPS and DNA. Uh, and so this is a very interesting question about what exactly DPS does when it binds to DNA. There's a lot of uh, phase transitions we think are going on, and there's a lot of questions we have about this. But that's not what I want to focus on here for the talk. Uh, instead, I want to focus on the question of how DPS gets started condensing the DNA. So how does it nucleate and start to bind to DNA in the first place? And a few years back, we developed a, a single molecule assay to probe this question. And the single molecule assay involved uh, immobilizing DNA onto a cover glass. We used intercalating dyes to be able to visualize what the DNA was doing. And we found a uh, residue that we could modify on the DPS in order to place a fluorescent label onto the DPS. This was a residue that was in that internal cavity that I mentioned before. So because the, the fluorescent dye was inside of the DPS, it didn't have any risk of interfering with the binding. So this, this mutated DPS binds just as well as wild type DPS to DNA. Uh, and then what we did was we, uh, I'll let this movie cycle again, we watched the DNA uh, sort of diffuse around uh, where from that point of attachment, so it's being subjected to Brownian motion, and we suddenly see labeled DPS arrive, and that freezes the molecule in place, and the labeled DPS arrives just all at once. So we have uh, a molecule of, D, uh, of DNA here that's around 20 
kilobases in length. And uh, based on the fluorescence, we think that it's binding hundreds of DPS dodecamers uh, once, it, uh, once it sort of anchors itself down like that. And the time before it binds, we see no indication that DPS is there. And suddenly there's hundreds of DPS dodecamers that are there all at once. So the binding happens in this very cooperative way. Uh, just to show you that in a few more charts here, if we follow the DNA over time and we follow the fluorescent signal to DPS, we can plot that out for different molecules. We see that the DNA is oscillating back and forth due to Brownian motion until the DPS arrives, then it freezes. It appears to be stochastic when exactly that nucleation event happens, but as soon as it happens, the fluorescent signal for the DPS just rockets up and goes up very much. And we can take lots of different uh, cases where the DPS was condensed by the DNA and average them together. And we can see that all of these hundreds of DPS molecules just sort of pour in over a few seconds, uh, just a few seconds uh, window as the DNA gets sort of condensed down there. So this was interesting. It's very difficult to, to look at this process in more detail because it's stochastic. You have to wait a long time before this event kicks in uh, with this assay. So we modified the assay a little bit to use magnetic tweezers uh, to study it uh, as well. So with magnetic tweezers, if you're not familiar with it, you can have a magnetic bead attached to your DNA. You can have a pair of permanent magnets that you raise and lower above that magnetic bead. And in that way, you can modify how much tension you're applying to the DNA. And what we've done here is when you have DNA that has nothing bound to it, if you've never seen the stretching curve, as you lower the force, the DNA condenses, 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 and gets smaller. This is, uh, this is uh, just sort of the physics of the worm-like chain involved. So it's mainly uh, what you're looking at here is entropic, uh, an entropic spring making the DNA want to coil up at the low forces. And then in the solid black line, we've lowered the force. In the dashed black line, we've slowly increased the force to pull the DNA out. And you can see that uh, those two lines lie on top of each other. It doesn't matter which direction you go, the DNA does the same thing in both cases. When we throw in DPS in here, we see something very different. What we see is at first, the DNA seems to follow along with the same curve that the naked DNA had, but we get below a critical force of around uh, just under two piconewtons, and suddenly the DNA will condense uh, very quickly due to the action of the DPS. Once it's condensed, it's, uh, the, the extension goes to almost zero. And if we start increasing the force now, what we find is that you have to pull it to a higher force. You still get a very sharp transition as it opens up, but you have to pull it out to this higher force before it opens up. And when that first happened, my, my first impression was that, well, uh, the graduate student working on this was pulling so quickly that you were getting a gap between when it, when it collapsed and when it opened up. So if we just did the experiment more slowly, we could watch these two curves approach each other. And there's an entire literature <clears throat> about you know, pulling on uh, DNA and watching things bind to it and looking at the difference between allowing the force to go down and allowing the force to go up. And you can learn a lot of sort of thermodynamics from those two things, uh, but Natalia, who was taking this data, took the experiment at you know, a half hour and then an hour and then two hours and then four hours. And that gap of five picanu never, never changed. So <clears throat> this was not so much of a problem of pulling too fast. This five picanu gap seemed to be something intrinsic to the system. And uh, while I don't have time to sort of go into it, this was published in the paper, we, uh, felt that we could kind of understand what was going on by applying an icing model, that this was similar to how you magnetize a crystal of iron, essentially, that uh, <clears throat> there's this cooperative effect between the different binding uh, subunits that want to either be all bound or all open. And so uh, you will get a region then from this prediction where you have multiple local minima that should be uh, very long-lived and have a lot of stability. And depending on how you approach this intermediate region, you can get stuck either in the extended or the condensed uh, local minimum between those. And you can learn a lot then about the gap between the force when it condenses and the force where it opens back up. 
This can tell you uh, a lot specifically about how the um, cooperative forces between DPS work, how the sort of uh, uh, self interaction between DPS works. But again, I don't have time to go too much into this model. It is published, you can see uh, down there if you wanna hear more about it. Because there was another question here that we still weren't getting at is trying to get at the mechanism of how exactly DPS does start nucleating. So we see, we still see this sort of uh, nucleation. We're waiting for nucleation. Once it starts, the DNA condenses pretty quickly after that, but we don't have a good sense of what that nucleation event looks like. And there's a few ideas that are out there from studies of other proteins that are known to condense DNA. So the, of the nucleoid associated proteins that are found in bacteria, there's uh, a lot of them that will condense DNA. Some of them do so through a mechanism where they induce kinks in the DNA or bends in the DNA. So HU, IHF, I, I, uh, and IHF are shown in this study, but also uh, FIS is another very common one that does the same thing. So these tend to be dimers, they bind, they stick into the DNA, they induce a kink. If you have a lot of kinks in DNA, it will stop being such an extended molecule and suddenly be a much more compact folded up molecule pretty quickly. So that's one way that you get this rapid condensation of the DNA, right? There's another uh, story though about how proteins can um, condense DNA that suggests a different mechanism where you have bridging interactions. And so HNS is a really good example of this. Uh, and in that case, what you have is a dimer that starts to form longer filaments of protein along a single strand of DNA, uh, but then it has extra binding sites uh, under the right magnesium, uh, magnesium conditions at least, that will stick to a neighboring piece of DNA. And so two strands of DNA can come together and get zipped up between these. And by bridging between different DNA strands, you can also uh, end up condensing the DNA. So we really wanted to understand, are we looking at bending or are we looking at bridging when, when DNA gets, when DPS gets started condensing this uh, DNA? So we were able to use this assay that uh, we, we had kind of recently stumbled across <laughs> uh, and it's a, called intercalation induced supercoiling uh, assay. And so what we did here was we took advantage of the fact that the fluorescent dyes that we use to track the DNA, they also intercalate into the DNA. And that has the effect in order to fit between two neighboring base pairs of DNA, you have to unwind the DNA a little bit to allow that dye to fit in between. And as you unwind the DNA, that has the effect of twisting the DNA of inducing a certain amount of supercoiling into the DNA. So here, we start with a piece of DNA that should have uh, uh, binding sites on both ends as we flow it across our cover slip that has streptavidin attached uh, at the end of pig molecules. Then one end will bind, the flow will stretch out the other end, so it will bind a little further downstream, and we'll have two points that we're bound at. And this means that the DNA, since we have multiple bitins on each side, that the DNA should be torsionally constrained and not allowed to twist up. So now as we add the dye and that induces some supercoiling into the DNA, that builds up and it forces the DNA to enter into a supercoiled state. The DNA responds by forming these plectinemic structures. Now, if you've worked with single molecules of DNA, especially long single molecules of DNA, you might be aware though that it's very difficult to avoid doing small amounts of damage to the DNA one way or the other. So a lot of our DNA strands end up having a, a type of damage called a nick in one of the two backbones of the two single strands of DNA that come together. And as soon as you have one nick anywhere along the length of your, your 20 kb DNA molecule, then all of that supercoiling that was building up in the DNA can just relax. It just can spin out and relax down. So in that case, the DNA, when it's knit, remains in this relaxed state. And uh, finally, in our experiment, you're going to also see a few molecules that only bind on one end. Uh, and again, this is sort of uh, like, like a, a feature that came out of what was a bug initially. But uh, with these long pieces of DNA, if you try to ligate uh, these, regions, uh, these regions with multiple biotins onto each end, it can be very hard to <clears throat> 
excuse me, it can be hard to make sure that you've purified away the DNA that is unligated. So we have a few strands that end up just having biotins on one end or the other. And when those come down, we end up with just a linear stretched piece of DNA under the flow. All right, so here's a movie of the experiment when it follows. Uh, there's a little back pressure as the flow gets started, but then the molecules get stretched out. You can see these different geometries in there and these little puncta build up over time. Those puncta represent uh, DPS binding to the DNA. Uh, we're doing alternating laser excitation to follow the DPS binding as well. Although with uh, slightly less time resolution, those uh, the, the DPS dodecamers bleach a little faster than our, our DNA does in these experiments. Um, but within this movie, uh, one thing I wanna emphasize here is that individual DNA molecules, we can easily sort into these different categories. So if you have supercoiled DNA, it has this really nice characteristic pattern that it does where you have a uh, plectinine that forms sort of a puncta, a punctate spot along the DNA. And this plectinine will sometimes diffuse back and forth along the DNA, but you always end up with a uh, DNA that's relatively taut between the two points of uh, attachment uh, with this bright puncta that's uh, moving back and forth in between them. And then once you apply flow, you can see what we call the DNA adopts this sort of Y shape. So here's that plectinine stretched out. It's extra bright because it represents two strands of DNA wrapped around each other. And then there's a sort of a slight little Y here. This is an upside down Y, right? That forms uh, between these. In contrast, we see something very different when we have DNA that has a nick in it, so it's relaxed. So then before we apply flow, we don't see the DNA taut between the two points of attachment. Instead, we see DNA that kind of flops around a little bit. Um, uh, we see it sort of uh, uh, bending and twisting uh, between those two points of connections. And then when we apply the flow, that DNA adopts this J shape instead. So it has a much smoother bend at the end and the two strands are separated by a small gap. Now, how far apart these two strands might be depends on how close these two points of attachment are to the surface. So there is some variation in there since that doesn't always come out the same way. You can see in this case that these two points tend to be downstream of each other, but they don't always end up lining up perfectly. And finally, the easiest thing to identify are the few molecules that are singly tethered. Uh, in that case, before we apply flow, we don't see an extended DNA molecule. We see just this, what, what I showed you before, a single sort of blob that's kind of diffusing back and forth around a central connection point. Once we apply flow, that DNA gets stretched out into a linear line. Uh, you know, we call this the I-shaped DNA, right? All right, so let's see what happens now when the D DPS arrives. So this little green dashed line represents the point where the DPS arrives based on the uh, red channel of fluorescence in the uh, uh, experiments that we're doing. And when we have supercoiled DNA, this Y-shaped DNA, you can see that plectinine is stretched out. As soon as DPS arrives, we tend to start, we see this uh, uh, start to shrink. We see DPS start to, uh, condense that DNA until it finishes in this little punctate spot. It takes about five seconds to condense once it gets going. Um, and uh, Elio, sorry to interrupt, just to let you know about like three more minutes, just to... Oh, okay, sorry, I'm going way over time. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no, no sorry, problem. I didn't, have, I didn't have a clock up here, so uh, all right. I apologize, <laughs> but I'll try to not go too, too much over. Um, we have the relaxed no DNA here. And uh, in that case, it forms the J shape. It takes a little longer to get started and then it forms a punctate spot. So it takes longer to get started. It condenses about the same speed. And finally, the linear DNA, that never nucleates until the flow is turned off at the end. So when we stop the flow at the red point, suddenly it will condense very rapidly and the DPS piles in there. And uh, just to plot out all of the molecules uh, in the movie that we were taking that this was based on, you can see that Every single one of the supercoiled molecules condenses before any of the relaxed molecules condenses. And the relaxed molecules show uh, a, a big range in times that they take to condense relative to the supercoiled ones. Uh, again, this is mostly because we think the supercoiled ones start condensing, nucleate very quickly, and then we're looking at how long it takes them to completely condense. 
Uh, these ones take a stochastic time to nucleate, and then they seem to uh, condense at a pretty linear rate. And then the linear DNA takes the most time to condense. So this supports an idea that we're, uh, DPS likes to make bridging contacts because the supercoiled DNA places the two strands close to each other. Uh, that would allow DPS to bridge between them. The relaxed DNA sort of intermediately helps to uh, allow these two strands to get close to each other, whereas the linear DNA, you don't get that at all. But we also had a more direct observation of this bridging contact and this cross-linking effect when we had two DNA strands that happened to be very close to each other. So in this case, a, a linear piece of DNA and a supercoiled piece of DNA are next to each other. DPS arrives, it condenses that plectinine in a pretty uh, uh, similar to what we saw above, but that linear piece of DNA, instead of just relaxing back to where it started, ends up being cross-linked to the plectinemic DNA, so the supercoiled DNA, and it stays there at the end. And so for two strands to be stuck to each other, that's uh, very clearly makes sense if we have these bridging contacts. It doesn't make sense for bending the DNA. Another little bit of direct evidence for the bridging contacts comes from after we allowed these things to condense, we flowed all the free DPS out of the buffer, and then we flowed in uh, new plasmids, which traveled through the buffer, and uh, when they hovered over uh, a condensed bit of DNA, if, uh, with some probability, they would stick to it and immediately condense themselves. And so we end up seeing a big boost in the total fluorescence of the spots when we watch this. That's what's plotted over here in B uh, once that capture happens. So there we have in 9 and 10 are, two are, are, are where this uh, diffuse plasmid suddenly bound to the surface and we see a bunch of uh, fluorescence kick up to there. And that really, again, only makes sense if we are, have some bridging contacts. If the DPS that's already bound to the one DNA molecule can form bridging contacts with this second one. Um, I'll have to sort of maybe hurry through this part, uh, uh, I guess, but we, if, if people are curious to hear more about it, we, we also found it kind of striking that once the DPS was condensed that you see a single spot of condensed DNA along with a stretched bit of extra DNA whenever we had these doubly tethered molecules. So at the end of the movie, we call them lollipops, right? And if you look where the DPS ends up, it's only bound to that condensed DNA. We don't see any DPS hanging around along the length of the naked DNA, uh, essentially. And so we wanted to make a little bit of sense of that. And we used a uh, markup chain Monte Carlo simulation. We split the DNA up into a bunch of uh, 60 base pair binding sites. And we just sort of interrogate at, at every uh, step along the way. We pick one of those binding states at random and flip it between bound and unbound. We assume that as soon as DPS binds, it's also going to condense that bit of DNA. Um, and to calculate the energies, we make different assumptions, either that the DPS is binding non-cooperatively or gets cooperative interactions only from nearest neighbors, or maybe it's doing something more like what we had before with uh, multiple neighbors being able to contribute together to stabilize the complex. Um, and we also have to calculate the energy it takes to stretch the DNA out in order to condense one subunit. So that's an, also an important component of the energy is this binds. Uh, and when we look at these different uh, traces of the, of the DNA binding with time, we do this simulation. Not surprisingly, the non-cooperative case, we just see uh, DPS distributed randomly everywhere along the length of the DNA. When we turn on the nearest neighbor interactions, we did see now islands of DPS separated by islands of naked DNA, but there were multiple islands. We didn't see just a single one. When we uh, increase the cooperativity so that we have up to six nearest neighbors contributing to the stability of the bound DNA, then uh, it takes longer for the system to achieve equilibrium. But once it gets there, it, it likes to have just a single island of DPS, condensed DNA and DPS, and a bunch of naked DNA in between there. And when we simulate what these different things would look like with the fluorescence, it's only the case of the high cooperativity icing model that we get something that matches what we saw in the experiment. Um, just really quickly then at the end, uh, going back to this idea that DPS likes to bind to the supercoiled DNA, why might that be? 
So in this cartoon, I try to draw on roughly what we think those N termini look like. There's a, a structure from AlphaFold that we use to, to model them, um, but we don't have a full structure with the full dodecamer with these on there. But what I want to emphasize is that while these N termini are uh, relatively long compared to the diameter of the dodecamer, they're still shorter than the entire dodecamer. And so we wouldn't expect them to be able to all reach a single strand of DNA. But if you bring two strands of DNA next to each other, suddenly the avidity of this interaction goes up by probably a factor of two, right? Because uh, however many could interact with one, now the ones on the other side can interact with the second bit of DNA. And when you look at the structure of uh, a plectinum of DNA, what's sort of predicted for how far the DNA should be apart from each other, uh, we, we've sort of modeled that here. The spacing that you expect between the two strands of the DNA is very closely matched to the diameter of the DPS dodecamer. So you have two parallel strands, they're spaced just at the right distance for DPS to slide in between there. And they're also slightly curved because of this twist that might also make it easier for DPS to interact with more parts of the DNA at once. So I think, you know, based on the structures, it sort of makes sense that the supercoiled plectinums of DNA would be an ideal place for DPS to nucleate and get started. There was also uh, just recently a paper uh, that came out while we were submitting uh, this uh, work. And um, uh, that shows these EM images that seem to show DPS trying to zip up to pieces of DNA. So again, that supports this idea of bridging contacts uh, between neighboring DNA molecules. So again, just to sum up, uh, what we see is that uh, DPS really prefers to nucleate on supercoiled DNA if it can. Uh, if it doesn't have supercoiled DNA, it does like to, it doesn't mind binding to relaxed DNA as long as that DNA is somewhat folded up, two strands coming together, and has most difficulty trying to bind to stretched linear regions of DNA. Um, once it condenses the DNA, on the other hand, uh, it forms a lot of these cooperative bridging contacts between different strands. And uh, it seems to be fine with changing the stoichiometry a little bit of this complex to bring in additional pieces of DNA. Uh, again, this plasmid that we flowed through was able to bind to these very well. So that finishes my talk. Um, a lot of this work was done by a former graduate student from my group called uh, Mahi Paul Ganji. He now has, is running his own lab uh, in uh, India and Bangalore uh, and doing great stuff there. A lot of the work on developing the fluorescent label for the DPS and so the magnetic tweezers work I showed you was done by another graduate student, Natalia Viterina, uh, who's now got a job in industry. And uh, currently we're doing some work to study these sort of different phases that DPS and DNA form with each other. And uh, that work's being carried out by a graduate student in Ann Meyer's group, uh, uh, Azra Walker. And this work's been a long collaboration with Ann Meyer and also uh, more recently with uh, Mo, who uh, we're working together to try to get some idea, some models for these different uh, configurations that DPS can bind DNA with. Uh, and thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>